Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's session, Traveling When Living with Chronic Kidney Disease. My name is Sakshi Goyal, and I am the Community Programs Coordinator at Saskatchewan branch of the foundation based in Saskatoon. In today's session, we will be discussing various aspects of traveling with kidney disease. We hope you'll be motivated to make that trip you've been putting off for a long time and be more comfortable doing so after hearing from our speakers. Our speakers represent a variety of different treatment modalities, such as peritoneal dialysis, hemodialysis, and transplant. First, we are going to hear from our speakers, then we will turn to our open conversation. We will then have some time to invite our audience to join us on a mic um, to share their experiences traveling with kidney disease, or you can also submit your questions through the Q&A box below the video panel. Um, so for confidentiality and so that our moderators do not miss the questions, please do not post them in the chat. I will now hand it over to our first speaker and moderator for the session, Dan Slater. Dan is a Toronto-based film director. When directing one of his movies, Dan experienced end-stage kidney failure and received a kidney transplant just two weeks after the wrap. Since then, he's teamed up with the Kidney Foundation of Canada to build awareness. Over to you, Dan. Thanks so much, Sakshi. Hey, everybody. How you doing? My name is Dan Slater. Uh, I'm a kidney patient for about five years. Um, three of those years, I lived with uh, low kidney function. And then in late 2020, I received a live uh, kidney transplant uh, through the Parrot Exchange Program and uh, have been about two years since that. So uh, we're here today to talk about traveling. So I love to travel. Um, I'm like a, or like a lot of you, I didn't travel very much when I was living with low kidney function. It's, it's difficult. I was worried about um, compromising my transplant. And then obviously when you get the transplant, you wanna be safe and you have to wait about a year before you can travel. So as soon as I got the doctor's go ahead to go, I, I traveled everywhere. I traveled for work. I travel for pleasure. I went to South Korea. I went to Brazil, Amsterdam, Belgium, England, and I had honestly no issues doing it until I went to the south of France. So if you take away anything from today, don't go to the south of France. I'm kidding. It's beautiful. The people are awesome. Please go to it. The food is incredible, mostly, but I ran into a bout of food poisoning and ended up in the hospital. Um, wasn't terrible. It was mostly they were just kind of monitoring me to be safe. But I did learn a few things that I wanted to share with you about traveling, which I now, you know, take a few more precautions and just kind of carry with me. So first off, we'll start with the big one, um, insurance. Uh, obviously, it's very important to have insurance when you travel. Luckily, I did have insurance through my provider. So that wasn't an issue. But I do wish I had learned about it or learn the process of it going into it. I wish I'd kind of read the fine print because if I did, I would have gotten them involved earlier. So I waited until I had a bill and I got home to call them and they were great on the phone, but it's a little harder to get the process going at home than it is during the hospital stay. Uh, one thing I, I could have used, honestly, was an interpreter and a lot of insurance companies provide interpretation services and um, I would have used that immediately and they would have got the process started and even potentially um, spoken with the hospital to just pay the bill out front. So I do wish I had that. Um, you know, I was in Nice, France. It's a touristy city. And being a North American, I assumed that probably at least one person in every major hospital speaks French and or English. And although this is true, uh, it wasn't true in the ER. So I could really use interpretation services when I was in the ER just to get better care, to let them know that I was a, a kidney patient, to uh, let them know that I had uh, previously had COVID because because they I couldn't tell them that they thought I had COVID and I got moved to a different ward. And it just inevitably ended up slowing down my care and getting into the part of the hospital where they could actually give me the things like anti-rejection medication, um, the kind of things to to, you know, um, kind of get to the root of the problem of the the food poisoning. Um, another thing I really wish I had done is uh, kind of looked up where I was going and got a sense of where the major hospital was in that area. 
Um, you know, there's several hospitals in Nice. The first one I went to was specifically for broken bones. Uh, they did not know what to do with me. I uh, ended up getting in another taxi and getting to a different hospital. Um, as you probably know, traveling during food poisoning is not the best. So go directly to where you need to get help. And I, I wish I had done that as well. Um, you know, same thing for, you know, it'd been nice to know what the medication is called in that sp specific language, uh, knowing how to get Tylenol. They don't call it Tylenol, Tylenol in France. So a little bit of research kind of going in would have done a, a lot of good for me. Um, again, like I did, none of this is to say to not travel. I'm going to continue traveling quite a bit. I think this is a one-off. And honestly, I ended up getting really good uh, service from the hospital. They, they took care of me, but you know, it, it, I could have been there for less time and I could have um, done a better job with uh, getting um, my insurance involved a little bit quicker. So the last thing I want to talk about is kind of the most important thing, which is, you know, kind of listening to your body when you're traveling. So we're all different. Uh, we all know when we're pushing ourselves a little bit too hard. This was a trip that I was away for three weeks. I was attending several film festivals. I was trying to get to everything. I was doing too much. So by the time I got to Nice, you know, my girlfriend was sick. We flew in pretty late. I think both of us had probably felt a little worn down, which just leaves you kind of susceptible to these sort of things. So, you know, maybe I didn't need to go for the third week. Maybe I could have gone for two weeks. Um, maybe I should have gotten Airbnb and cooked some meals as opposed to eating every single meal out in a restaurant, which I think just eventually kind of wears you down. So, you know, it's not going to stop me from 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 traveling in the future, but I'm definitely going to do it uh, a little bit more safely. Um, I think the other thing too is that you know I was in Nice for four days. I never I've been in Nice for twelve days because I had to stay, but I was there for four days. I wanted to do everything, but because of that, I know I, I skipped a lunch here and there, and I, I I pushed hard, and maybe I didn't drink enough water, and you know. I'm a person that I bet everybody can kind of appreciate that I need to eat constantly. I need to eat when it's available and when it's hot and you're running around and you're thirsty and you might pick the wrong place to eat at, which I did. It had all of the signs of a place that you don't want to get a carbonara at and paid the price. So again, I don't think it needs to happen, but you travel enough or anybody travels enough, you're going to run into these issues and it's good to be prepared going into it. I think the last thing I can say is, you know, obviously we're getting to a post COVID world and that has some bumps and bruises to it. Um, you know, part of the not benefit of COVID, but when I first got out of my transplant, you know, ev everybody was wearing a mask and that was great because I need to wear a mask. So I actually felt really comfortable for it during those first few trips, but going to England, going to Belgium, uh, going to Amsterdam, there are nobody wearing masks on planes or in in restaurants or that sort of thing. So again, it's just keeping that mindset that you're going to be in places that might push you in your comfortability. And I think it's still worth going, but just know that if you're going to a busy area and you feel that you need to wear a mask, having that on you, just knowing that you do need to still be cautious and washing your hands more for that kind of reason that I hopefully in a year, we don't have to think about this too much, but it's still in that awkward period. And uh, it's really important just to make sure you stay safe. So I think that about does it for me. And I, again, can't stress enough, please travel as much as you can. I'm going to do it. So uh, thank you so much for having me. And I'm going to send it over to our next speaker, Susanna. But at first, I'm just going to give a little bit of information on her. Uh, Susanna was diagnosed with lupus in her teens, which slowly began to attack her kidneys. At age 21, she started hemodialysis, then switched to perennial dialysis for a total of four and a half years. Susanna is proud to say she received the gift of, gift of life from an angel donor. Since then, she has been involved in the annual kidney walk through the Kidney Foundation. Susanna recently celebrated her 14th kidney, kidney, kidney anniversary and is an organ donor advocate. I will now pass it on to you, Suzanne. Thanks, Dan. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, so as Dan said, uh, I'm a kidney transplant recipient of 14 years, and I waited almost four and a half years on dialysis. So I did a combination of PD, which is peritoneal dialysis, and hemodialysis. And I never took the chance on hemo uh, as I wasn't 
Um, I probably didn't have the funds to travel when I was younger on hemo. Uh, and I also thought it was more complicated. And then, but PD kind of gave me a little bit more leeway. And you'll you'll hear more uh, from uh, someone after me, a guest speaker talking more about that. Um, but I want to share after my transplant, I got that new lease on life. I never really got to fully travel outside of Canada. Um, so every year I tried to do something for my second chance at life. Um, I'm living not for only myself, but for my angel donor. So for, and I call my uh, kidney, uh, my kidney's name is Beaner. So me and Beaner celebrate every year as much as we can. Uh, so on Beaner's fifth kidney anniversary, we went to Costa Rica. I was zip lining on our, the day that I received the transplant, the anniversary. Um, and then I went to Cuba a few times, which I absolutely loved. Um, you do not go there for the food, but the beautiful beaches and the people are just amazing. Uh, and my recent one, and then COVID kind of put a halt um, on everybody. And then the other is, uh, I just got back from the Dominican Republic, which I have never been to. Um, so we recently, we went to the Dominican Republic and I haven't traveled in a very long time. So I was very anxious, very nervous, uh, probably a month prior. Uh, my husband knew right away, like, I just, I got anxious. I had to have everything in a row. I had my lists. I had everything kind of pulled out. I had a box to put everything in. But things that I wanted to bring forward as a reminder for patients, uh, either if it's on their kidney journey or transplant journey, uh, is to how to prepare. Like the things I thought about that my husband or friends or my mom even wouldn't even think of that I would need to look into are updated vaccines. So yes, I was updated with COVID, um, but I first reached out to my transplant team to say, hey, this is kind of what I'm doing. Are you okay if I travel? You know, they kind of give you, yep, thumbs up. They won't say during COVID, we encourage you to travel during COVID. Uh, they leave it up to us, which puts more pressure. Like they won't say yes or no, but um, but yes, uh, life can't be put on hold forever, but to know your precautions and how to prepare. Um, so vaccines, I reached out to, and every province will be different, um, but there's a vaccine clinic, travel clinic, and I made sure like for transplant patients, uh, we cannot have any live vaccines. They all have to be uh, dead vaccines. Um, so I got everything updated that I need to. Um, and then for medications. I think medications are number one. I bring, if I'm going away for a week, I take two weeks of medications and a different, different ways I bring medications. D every day I bring my medic, oh, let's see, medication pack. Okay. Let's see if we can do that. Medication pack. It's free of charge. Oh, let's see there. It's free of charge by the pharmacy. Everything is distributed into every day. And if you have to take medications multiple times a day, I find that the easiest. Every week I'm not having to open my bottles and put it in my daily accounts. Or, you know, if I'm really tired or not feeling well, I'm not like double checking which ones I took. Or I've been in that position where maybe I'm like, did I take my medications? So I always just, it's listed Monday to Friday, and then the multiple different morning, afternoon, or morning, mid-morning, lunch, and dinner, or after work. And so that's kind of how I take my meds every day. Traveling is a little bit different because if I want to pack light, um, I find these are too bulky because this is just one week's worth. But one thing I found on Amazon, which was very handy, so there's seven days worth, and basically it's listed as Sunday. And then there's two clasps saying morning and night. So I would just prepare these um, when I got to where I was traveling to because airplanes and security and everything want to know what you're packing. So as I bring all my meds, whoop, let's see if I can do this. Anyways, it's a Ziploc full of my all my tablets uh, with my name, my phone number, my email address. 
And I take that with me. And then I also get transplant to make a travel letter. Anytime you're wanting to travel outside of Canada, you should get a travel letter from transplant. Because when you go through security, people want to uh, people will want to know, or if you get hospitalized, you have everything listed by your transplant and it's signed off by your doctors. Um, other things to think of bringing is your blood pressure monitor, your thermometer. Um, if you're not feeling well, you know right away to check your beat blood pressure and your temperature. Um, I think that's very important. And one thing to do is to always pack your medications and anything like that on your carry-on. Um, I've heard many people bring their medications just on their, their checked bag. And if, as you know, you've heard in the news that people have lost luggage. It's just a gong show. And I really uh, encourage you to pack your meds or anything important, which is for me, I don't bring any jewelry, but this is my key is my meds. Um, and then just like, as I went to an all-inclusive, I wear a mask like Dan on the plane. I, sometimes I'm like, I'm the only one, but you know, I feel way better because you hear people once they get to their destination, they get sick, you know, and I'm high-fiving myself because I didn't get sick, you know? Um, and it's just, you want to enjoy your vacation when you get to your destination. And the other thing too, is a lot of people think when you go to like buffets at all inclusives and stuff like that, things I avoid is salads and I only eat peeled fruit. So because we don't know, you know, we drink from water bottles, we don't drink the water there. We don't know if their salads are washed in their water. You know, they could say it is, but I just avoid because I don't want to get sick like Dan did, you know? And so I tend not to eat the best on vacation. It's more fried food and, you know, um, and, but then when I get back, I get crave salads and stuff like that. So again, like Dan, I listen to my body if I'm not feeling up to doing something. And that's the hardest thing is saying no, if you are with a whole bunch of people and they're like, okay, let's go here. Let's go there. It's okay to say no, that you just kind of want to hang out by the pool, or you just want to take it easy, read a book. You don't always have to keep up with other people because I think people forget that you have other challenges. You're taking lots of meds. You're not feeling well. So listening to your body and giving self-care to you, to yourself. Uh, thank you for, so much for having me. I'll let Sakshi introduce the next speaker. Um, thank you, Susanna, for sharing some great advice with us here. Moving on to our next speakers, Kathy Kovacs and Irvin Schweitzer. Kathy is a physician and chief of staff at a community hospital in West End, Ottawa. Despite a diagnosis of kidney disease, she has not let this determine how she lives her life. Being on peritoneal dialysis is not a hindrance to visiting her grandchildren as often as possible. And Irvin is Kathy's care partner. Kathy was unexpectedly diagnosed with CKD in 2016 following a series of routine medical appointments. Irwin has been by Kathy's side throughout their kidney journey. Kathy is currently on peritoneal dialysis and they're hopeful that her surgeon will give them a go ahead for transplant surgery in about a year. Over to you, Kathy and Irwin. You want to start, Kat? So uh, thank you very much for having us. Um, you know, it's, uh, I, ha I have to admit, we haven't had as glamorous traveling as uh, some of the others. And, 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 you know, part of that is that we're a little older and have already traveled quite a bit. Um, but uh, I certainly did have uh, quite a bit of anxiety about uh, uh, traveling once I started peritoneal dialysis. I started in... Um, June of uh, last year, um, so it's it's not been that long, um, and it, a lot of things that you wouldn't really think about are um, are of concern. First of all, I do worry a great deal about diet and what I eat, and because I want to feel well, and I know when I don't eat uh, what I usually eat, then I I don't feel as well. Um, so that's really important, and sometimes. You know, other people that you're with don't fully understand that. So you really have to uh, assert yourself and uh, know what's good for you and, and uh, you know, help uh, people understand. Um, 
the other uh, thing is that there's a lot of equipment uh, that we have to take. I'm on the cycler, um, and Erwin will talk more about it, setting up the equipment uh, and planning for it because I leave it completely up to him. I'm very fortunate. My husband's, um, I would say, rather obsessive um, and very uh, concerned about my health and welfare, uh, which is lovely uh, and very detail oriented. And I can guarantee you that not once has he forgotten anything. Um, so for us, the, the first couple of trips were tense. Our grandchildren, they just live in Toronto and our children. Um, so the first thing is, is the packing, which everyone will talk more about. But you know, it's the space that matters as well because on peritoneal dialysis, I, I do it at nighttime and it's about eight and a half hours where I'm hooked up to the cycler. Um, so little things like, how do you go to the bathroom? How close is the bathroom? Um, so, so the actual environment that you're going to be sleeping in while you're on the cycler is, is really quite important. Um, and, and those are details that I won't get into, but you do have to scan out the, uh, the place that you're going to be uh, sleeping and staying. Um, and then, you know, there, there are, there, there's a lot of uh, the equipment uh, that's necessary. And then what do you do if you don't feel well? So that's happened to me. Uh, where I didn't feel so well and had to, you know, end up seeing somebody. So you have to be very prepared with regards to your health history. And as uh, Susanna mentioned, your medication. Um, and I think you really need to know very well what your needs are, what your treatment would be, and what signs and symptoms of any kind of deterioration are. Um, and I think all of that's quite important. Uh, so, you know, an organization being very, very organized. Um, so the first couple of times were stressful, but now I'm getting more accustomed to it and we go for longer um, and uh, are starting to think about how we will uh, fly to my family in, in Maritimes and hopefully gradually uh, go further and further afield. But you know, it, it, there's no doubt that there is uh, some stress involved, but every time you do it, uh, you feel a bit more confident. Uh, so I think what I've learned from all of this is I can't let it stop me. For a while, COVID was a bit of an excuse, um, but I can't let it stop me. And I want to uh, live my life to the fullest. Um, and, uh, so, and, and so far I've been able to, I work a lot. Um, I like to socialize and I love to be with my family. Um, so I'll let Erwin go ahead and uh, he's my, I always call him my home CEO. So go for it, Erwin. Thanks, Kath. So as Kathy's mentioned, um, I like to say that I'm detail oriented as opposed to obsessive. Uh, has a bit of, of a negative tone. But that being said, and following on what Susanna's done, when we travel, I have a list and it's detailed right down to uh, the number of days that we'll be away and how much we have to take. So this is our list. Um, it's not a very long list. You see that the page is longer than the actual list. But by using this checklist, I'm guaranteed that I won't forget anything going to our destination. Coming home, it's not necessarily the same thing. I have left things behind. But since so far, the only travel that we've done is to Toronto to visit our uh, family, it's not been an issue. Um, so I'm right down to, on my list, the number of gauzes that we need to take with us uh, to change dressings after uh, Kathy has a shower. Um, peritoneal dialysis allows us to travel. One of the things that it does not allow us to do is to travel spontaneously. There is planning that's involved and that's been mentioned by Susanna and Dan as well. Um, we have to know when we're going, we have to know how long we're going for, we have to plan, uh, certainly in the winter traveling down the, the 401, uh, the possibility of being snowed in, which fortunately we have not been. 
but if we're going for four days, I'll make sure that I have supplies that'll last us for one or two days extra, should we be delayed in our return. So that means everything is uh, added to. So if I need four days worth of dialyzing solution, I'll take six days. Fortunately, since we stay with our daughter, we can leave some supplies there. So subsequent trips means that we bring less, but we always have a little bit of extra. Um, the other thing that I can mention is that uh, being outside of our environment, being outside of Ottawa when we travel, means that we don't necessarily have the medical resources that we are used to availing ourselves of, but our clinic is just a phone call away and they are an absolute delight to work with. They are prompt at returning calls should we need to make them. They are enthusiastic. The nursing staff is good. We have what we believe to be very positive relationships with both the medical and nursing staff there. And they've always been able to accommodate certainly my nervousness about traveling uh, at the beginning. Uh, as Kathy mentioned, we are looking forward to going down to visit uh, Kathy's brother and his children and uh, rest of the family sometime starting in May. That's going to be uh, a new step for us because we will be flying, which will involve a little bit more in the way of planning to make sure that our equipment comes with us. Fortunately, uh, Baxter, who is the company that provides the dialyzing uh, solution as well as other supplies, has a travel service that um, we can avail ourselves of, and they will ensure that the fluids that we require for peritoneal dialysis will be available for us at our destination. As Kathy mentioned, the environment that we will be in is uh, important. Knowing uh, how close the bathroom is to the bedroom uh, allows us to make accommodations for removing the used fluids easily or not. Um, using the washroom overnight if necessary is also a uh, factor since Kathy's attached to the machine. Uh, there are ways around that. Um, we can detach Kathy from the machine for periods of time or um, use a commode if one is required. It's been a learning experience. Um, and as Kathy's mentioned, we have tried not to let Kathy's uh, kidney issues rule our lives. We accommodate it. As life goes on, we will continue to make accommodations. We are hoping to get to the point uh, where we are just like Susanna and Dan with respect to uh, transplant. Um, that will bring its own challenges in terms of how we live, but it will certainly make us a little bit more mobile when it comes to traveling. And I've certainly learned a fair bit from both Dan and Susanna with their experience traveling a little bit further than just staying in Canada. Um, I think that's all that I would have to say. Uh, thanks, Sachin. I just wanted to add that my husband is involved with the peer support program and it has been amazing. Sometimes I listen. Um, and it, it, what an amazing group of people. Um, so I certainly would recommend that to uh, anybody who's a, a caregiver or, you know, if a person requires peer support themselves, the Kindy Foundation has been a tremendous resource. Thanks, Kat. Thank you, Kathy and Owen. That was great. Uh, Dan, we do have some questions in the chat here. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, guys. Um, before we do, so we're going to open it up to a bit of a fireside chat uh, a Q and A. So you can either put your questions into the Q and A, or you can raise your hands, and we can kind of uh, ask uh, those of you that way. Um, I did want to follow up with. Um, just for Kathy and Irwin. So you talked a lot about packing. Um, it sounds like some of those bags are heavy. What any tips for how to condense that? Like how many, how many bags are you checking there? Uh, <laughs> um, for Kathy, we need to use uh, two bags per night. Each bag contains five liters and they are very heavy. There's really no way to condense them. 
Um, I think on our last trip, we just got back from Toronto on Monday. We took six boxes. Each box weighs between 20 and 30 pounds. So I'm adding um, an extra 180 pounds approximately to the weight of the car. So our gas mileage goes down a little bit. Um, that's one of the reasons why I think Baxter provides the service that they do in, in ensuring that you have your dialysis solutions at your destination because there's really no way to um, compress the volume. Uh, it is what it is. Uh, we take the cycler with us. It has its own bag. Uh, when we go in the car, um, we have a carry bag for it. When we plan to go to Halifax, we will be able to rent from the hemodialysis clinic uh, a travel case. It's more like um, photographers and people carrying very expensive things will know about Pelican cases. It's basically a metal case that's uh, foam padded. So I believe the cycler fits into um, Baxter's version of a Pelican case, and that would have to be checked. It's really too large to take on as carry on. As far as I know, uh, there may be exceptions made for medical equipment. That would be my biggest concern about flying anywhere, given what happened over uh, the Christmas holidays with people's luggage going awry. We can manage almost anything save for the misplacement or loss of the cycle. That would be very, very traumatic. Thanks. I think that that's super helpful just to give uh, people an idea of what it looks like to travel like that. It's, just, uh, it's nice to be able to visualize it. Uh, Susanna, I had a question for you. So you talked about, you know, some of your vacations and, and, and I'm sorry if I missed this, but for that first vacation after the transplant, um, what was it like leading up to that? Were you nervous? Were you excited? Like what was, what were your feelings? Um, very nervous, very anxious. Uh, yeah, that for me is I'm a planner, so it's very hard to plan the unexpected. And I feel you have to over bring everything like, like I always have to say, okay, if this happens, I'll bring this. And if this happens, I'll bring this. And then I'm packing way more than my husband does. And it's not even clothes, it's medic medical stuff. And that's the most frustrating thing is that I feel like I have more medication stuff and what ifs than actual clothes or anything nice and pretty, what, you know? Um, and so that's the hard thing for me. And, um, it, and I've been very blessed that I've never had to use it but I always feel safer. Okay. I've had this, I brought it and I'm very, I'm very lucky. That's nothing. Nothing's ever happened when I've traveled. Uh, my two trips to Cuba, my Dominican trip and to um, Costa Rica. Um, but then even camping, I, when I lived in Alberta, I traveled to Jasper and I would be pulled off the side of the road and where you would hang your uh, where you get your laundry done and hang it on the back of your car, you know, your nice, clothes, I would hang my dialysis bag, get a chair and sit at my the roadside with my dialysis bag and I would do dialysis. Um, just anything that would make me feel a little bit more normal when in my mid 20s with my friends, you know, so I was very blessed to be able to do those kinds of things on PD. Yeah, I've seen uh, a couple peers camping and hanging dialysis bags off of tree branches and I think that's pretty cool um yeah that's all great information so we have quite a few uh questions coming in um I feel like we'll just throw it to the the Q&A chat and I feel like this is first keeping with you Susanna um are you allowed to zip line with a kidney transplant or perhaps what are some travel activity restrictions to be aware of when traveling there are restrictions, but I did get the okay from transplant. So I did go zip lining. Um, there's specific like sports or like my last, we just went to Vancouver Island and we had a place an Airbnb with a hot tub, but my husband was able to use it, but I wasn't because of the, they harbor. I mean, we don't know how well it was taken care of. It was maybe our own hot tub. It would maybe be different because we knew it when it was last cleaned and all that kind of stuff. So I didn't take advantage of those um, because um, 
hot tubs and all that kind of, they harbor germs, the heat and everything from, so there's a lot of things that I do not do, but I try to do as much as I can. And I highly recommend ziplining. Yeah. I think the trick is, is before you do anything, you run it past your team. Uh, they'll understand kind of your specific, you know, place and, and, and what, what all your, uh, you know, uh, what, what your possibilities are. So it's always good, but for sure, ask them because I think it's really easy, or this is what I did earlier is that I just thought, no, I can't do these things. I'll never go skiing again. And then they were fine with skiing. Um, so it's good to ask because you might get an answer that you don't expect. So we have quite a few questions about insurance. Um, Obviously, insurance is super important, and it's also a bit of a tricky question to answer just because depending on where you are, it's very different. Obviously, a lot of people have different experiences um, receiving insurance and, and being turned down by insurance. It's very tough. So uh, one of the questions, um, any recommendations for companies that provide travel insurance to transplant patients? Um, they have been denied before. And another um, can anyone speak to traveling over 70 years of age with CKD insurance companies that are better for the others? Um, anybody have anything to add for this? There is um, a list that the Kidney Foundation puts out. It's called Tips and Tricks, uh, Travel Tips and Tools, excuse me. And it lists uh, a number of different insurance companies. The foundation makes no endorsement of any company over any other. The list is there as, um, I presume, a sampling, and the list is available on the Kidney Foundation website. So um, people who do have questions about insurance in particular, as well as other travel tips and tools, should avail themselves of that particular document on the website. Um, I received my copy just the other day and I'm surprised at how detailed it is in terms of what needs to be done for the different types of dialysis that people are doing, as well as what uh, people like Susanna and Dan should consider doing with respect to insurance and preparations for travel. Yeah, and I, I'll uh, just update that. That specific um, form isn't online, but if you reach out to your specific uh, peer support group because it'll be different province to province so reach out to your peer support groups or uh, whoever is your contact there and i bet they can send something along um, or if you're joining peer support groups it's a good place to discuss these things because you'll find that you'll get information from someone who might be getting um, insurance this way so for me personally my insurance comes through my job i just have travel insurance another thing to look into is some of the cards like American Express have travel insurance, but just be super cautious that whenever you're, you know, picking a plan that they are aware of whether or not you're on transplant or on dialysis, um, that, you know, there's no surprises for them because I think we all know that insurance companies will find any reason to deny things. So just be cautious. Uh, another patient, it's the same question, but I just wanted to highlight them. Um, this person is uh, a non-dialysis patient, but recently diagnosed with low uh, GFR and uh, 20 and immune suppressed as a result of underlying autoimmune Sogren syndrome. Sorry if I got that wrong. Uh, always love traveling, but now nervous and also concerned uh, with how difficult it might be to get travel insurance. So, you know, again, I did travel when I had a low uh, GFR. Um, I did have travel insurance. It is possible. Just it's going to take a lot more research for us than other people. Get the right one. There's, you know, a handful out there, at least a dozen out there. Just go through them all. Get on these uh, peer support groups and ask people what they've done. I also just want to add to that, Dan, is that um, if your local branch doesn't have an actual peer support, every branch has a peer support program, but it may not be a, a group per se, but reach out to your programs coordinator at each branch and they can be able to give you that those links as well. Um, going to talking a little bit more about insurance. Um, it is very tricky. Um, you know, you are paying a, a premium sometimes because you have a pre-existing condition. One thing I have taken note over the years is that I try to 
not like I, tr- I tell my transplant team that I'm, this is my plan at during this month. Um, and if is everything is going well with my blood work, I don't want any changes to my medications because please know that anything is, and this is something I've learned is that if your medications have changed within three months of your travel date, that will put a tick. If something happens over, like out of country or wherever you're traveling, your insurance company will make that note. They'll see that change. There was a local story here in Saskatchewan that, you know, his, I think just a basic medication and, uh, it changed by 0.5 milligram and he had to pay out of pocket, but luckily it went uh, into the news and made a big story. And so the province is paying for that. But just those little things that will help you tell your team, if everything's settled, like subtle and everything's good, please don't change my meds. You know, even, even if there's a doctor's appointment in there, insurance will be like, oh, why were you seeing the doctor? So just take note, not that you, I'm not telling you not to go see the doctor, but just note because, you know, you are paying paying premiums to see um, for travel insurance. And just as a FYI, I think that's really important to know. Yeah, really, really good point. And uh, one more point, just on insurance. Another question is, do you need insurance if you're traveling from province out, out of province in Canada? And the answer is yes, you need travels and ins- travel insurance outside of whatever your home province is. Um, just a reminder, uh, keep putting up your hands if you have any questions, and we're actually going to let you come on for live audio and uh, ask those questions to us or to the whole panel. Uh, we'll get to a couple more Q&A questions in the chat first, and then we'll probably open up to the floor. Um, okay, this is from Francine. Uh, I have one kidney, no dialysis, no medication. We are planning on going on going on a Viking luxury cruise in Europe. We would have to fly to Amsterdam. Would that be safe? I would first talk to your um, your doctors to make sure they're okay with you traveling. I think that's number one. Um, that's the first person I would reach out to and ask. And to make sure you're comfortable enough and making sure you kind of all have your ducks in a row, make your, I always tell, I always suggest people, and I have a notebook for myself, any appointments I go into, I write all my worries and my questions down for the doctor, Um, have your blood work done too, just to make sure everything's good before, well, three months prior to, and uh, just making, keeping everything steady in your life. Yeah, that's a great, great answer. Um, another question, um, did anyone try backpacking trips? How did you stay safe with your health in areas that might be considered a bit more risky? Um, I can speak to that. Uh, so my last uh, trip going to Europe, I was backpacking. Um, I did stay in hostels, though I, me and my girlfriend got a um, private rooms, um, not honestly, specifically because of the health issues, mostly because I'm 37 and I'm too old to be in a, a, a 30 room hostel. But I think that is one of the things you can do while being safe. I don't think backpacking is necessarily more unsafe than other trips. I don't, I don't think you get, you can get food poisoning, you get food poisoning from a resort, you can get it from a, a boat, you can get it from any kind of trip. It's the same things. It's just being really cautious about, you know, what you eat, you know, when you walk in somewhere, it's, it's when it might be an issue and, and just wash your hands a lot. But uh, I'd, I'd say go for it and talk to your doctors first, but I, I don't see it being that different. Okay. Um, let's see. Here's one from uh, Lean. I'm on hemodialysis. I want to travel. Is there a list of hospitals that I can go to in US, Mexico, and other countries around the world because I have to call myself and there's cost? Also, traveling in Canada is hard. Almost all hospitals are not taking visitors, especially in Quebec and New Brunswick. Um, I'll take a stab at this one. Um, Going back again to the travel tips and tools document, there is a list of websites and phone numbers that will uh, provide um, you with information about those centers and sites that will consider taking you on as um, an out of town uh, dialysis patient, uh, should they have the space. And I'm guessing that this would have to be planned 
well in advance of your trip so that you know that you have a space. Uh, once again, the document that I've referred to a couple of times now is really an astounding amount of, of gold. Um, it covers um, sites in the States, um, global states. It's really, I'm just, um, and it even has dialysis at sea. So it's um, dialysis at sea.com. Uh, so not knowing what the specifics are of these particular sites, um, there are resources that you can call upon to ensure that at your destination, you would be able to uh, be dialyzed as required if space is available. That's great. And again, I think uh, reaching out to your, you know, regional um, uh, kidney foundation branch, it just, you know, we get all this information, especially because we're part of the peer support group, but it is not information that you can't get either. So it's really, uh, it's really important to, to reach out to your branch. Um, that actually kind of goes with this next question. Um, I'm an Ontario, I'm in Ontario, and I'm the support person for my mom who is 84 and on HD. Where do I find a peer support group? Thanks. So um, I'd like to plug the uh, caregivers peer support group. I'm one of the co-facilitators. I'm based in Ottawa. It's for Ontario. Um, it is a very dynamic, gregarious, uh, well-intentioned group. Uh, people truly involved and interested in ensuring that the caregivers have an opportunity to discuss their cares and concerns, making sure that your caregiver is well taken care of means that their patient, their loved one is also well taken care of. Um, I don't uh, know specifically where in Ontario this person is, but if you call your local chapter, they'll be able to put you in contact with the coordinator for all of the peer support groups. There may even be one that uh, your mom might be interested in joining locally. Certainly doing things virtually uh, makes it a lot easier. There's no need to travel to various hospitals or wherever these uh, peer support groups might be uh, holding their meetings. But the caregiver support group is across the province. So um, we will always be virtual. And I can tell you from my experience, and as you've heard Kathy say, it's been uh, a very, very valuable and rewarding experience, both for myself as a co-facilitator, a caregiver, and for my wife as one who gets the benefit of the knowledge that I pick up from the group. And I would like to add to Irwin's as well. I, I understand um, some of the peer support group I belong to is um, we, I connect with our local programs coordinator and they will match you up one-on-one -on -one with the person that is best suited for you. So I know Ontario has support groups, but some of the other branches have a more one-on-one -on -one per se. Um, so just connect with your local group as well, uh, your local branch. And that way we can, uh, like the programs coordinator will, uh, set you up based on what you specifically are looking at and if it's like a hemo to hemodialysis you know story or um pd to pd or you know anything like that so i just want to let you know that yeah i can absolutely second that that's a great great advice okay we have a little bit more of a comment but um actually a couple of things has anybody tried uh tracking uh putting a, a tracking device in their check bags is that uh, something people would encourage i've never done that i just actually got one for christmas because we heard horrific stories uh around christmas time in january where all this lost baggage was at the toronto pearson and uh i'm in saskatchewan but we were traveling through toronto so um i i'm not sure what it's called uh air tank air takes for iPhones. And then I have a Samsung Android and it's basically the same thing, but it's a, it's an app you download on your phone. Um, even when we were waiting for our bag, we knew our, my bag was somewhere else. Um, and it just kind of shows you where it is within, you know, if your bag is in still in the Dominican and I'm at the Pearson, you know, that kind of thing. So I found that very handy because then you're not waiting around. You can go to the help desk right away and you'd be like, there's my bag. This is where I am. So 
Awesome. Thank you. Okay, we have a question that was posed in French and has been given to me in English. Um, so I apologize in advance if it's nowhere near what you was asked for in French. Um, I've already explained my ability or non-ability to talk to people in French. Um, can you tell us about your health insurance? Oh, it's another health insurance question. Uh, when traveling outside of your province country, do you have insurance other than RAMQ, Quebec government insurance? Um, yes. Uh, everybody should have a travel insurance that's outside of the, the basic insurance that they have. Um, I think it's absolutely necessary. I don't think I'm going on a limb and saying that. So get travel insurance outside of anything that you have. Um, and just, again, really understand it. Really understand what you get out of it. Understand the, the downfalls and, and just make sure you're ready for it when, when you need to um, use it. Okay. Let me go. Let's see. Um, I think we're ready for if there's a couple hands up, um, we can try and see if we can get the them to to pop up here and ask their own question. Yes, Bonnie, you're with us. Um, if you unmute yourself, I think you can talk. We don't hear you, Bonnie, but you are unmuted. I'm not sure if it's something on your end. How about now? Yep, you're good now. Okay, uh, I'm Bonnie's car caregiver, David. And uh, I want to make a couple of points to build on what uh, Irwin was saying. Uh, number one, in terms of knowing where the bathrooms are and things like that, <clears throat> we did quite a bit of traveling when Bonnie was on the uh, cycler at night. Uh, doing PD, uh, we got a portable commode. Uh, it, it's uh, one that's used for camping. It's very light um, and uh, it worked beautifully, number one, so we never had to worry about where the bathrooms were. If you're doing a car trip and you're staying at a hotel, you don't necessarily know what the configuration of the room is going to be like, but if you have your portable commode, you're good to go. The second thing we got was a portable IV a pole. It's uh, just a, it just sits in a very small vinyl bag. Uh, it takes a minute to uncollapse it. And now you, do, again, don't have to worry about tree branches or anything else. Uh, it weighs probably a pound at most. And it even comes with a, a strap that you put over your shoulder. So um, those are two very practical ways to get around um, the limitations or the requirements of, of PD. Um, the third thing is um, that you need a bag for uh, outflow. Again, if there isn't a, a bathroom around or you don't want to carry a, a big gas tank uh, container for your outflow, uh, again, we, we went, got a camping bag. It's actually a water container that people can take when they want to transport water uh, on a camping trip, uh, but it worked beautifully for the outflow. So that, that, those are three practical situations that made the travel, and we did car trips, even um, 500, 700 mile car trips, and that was one way we were able to do it. But there is a consideration you, you do have to make, and that is if you are taking the dialysate yourself in your trunk, um, you have to be uh, concerned about the weather. Uh, dialysate only operates within a certain temperature range. Um, you can't go below a certain temperature or above a certain temperature. Uh, it could affect the dialysate itself. So just be cautious in, in knowing that, that you have to, if you are going to travel with your own dialysate, that you should uh, be aware of, of keeping it temperature controlled. It puts a wrinkle in it, especially because our car trips are usually in the summer when it's hot. And uh, uh, usually uh, at night, I would take all the boxes into the hotel um, where it was climate controlled. And then uh, next morning as we were leaving, put them back all in the car. So that's how we got around it. One final point, uh, and that I think is important because it, uh, it happened to us is when you are traveling to a particular destination, um, 
find out where the nearest clinic is. That's really important. If there is a, an incident that that you you have in the middle of the night or something like that, um, you won't be able to reach your own clinic for advice or questions. But if you if you know that there's a hospital nearby that does uh, handle either hemo or PD, at least you have a resource that you can go to. Uh, we, in one case, we traveled to Ottawa and we were able to call into the Ottawa people and they were fantastic, although they recognized we were from the Toronto area. In fact, um, uh, using a different company's uh, uh, cycler. A cycler. So um, those would be all the points I wanted to make. Sorry I took so long. No, I think those are really, really great points. Uh, thank you so much uh, for raising your hand. Uh, do we have one more person with their hand raised? Uh, one more question from the Q&A, and this is for Susanna, if I can find it. Um, they just wanted to ask about uh, the app that you were using. I lost it, but yeah, they're asking about the app you're using, what it was called. Oh, let me find it. Um, I will get back to you. I will find it, and I will put it in the chat, or I might just jump in here and let you know. Um, I forget what it's called, but I will find it for you. Um, I also wanted to go back to Irwin um, and the other, I think it was Bonnie's caregiver too, um, about, oh, the carry on for your, you know, your anything like I've, I've been asked and I feel like it's a more popular question now from the airlines is that, are you willing to check your checked bag? Um, and they will do that at the gate. And that's one thing. Don't offer your bag. And if they're like looking at you or just say, I have all my medications and they will understand and they won't do that. Same with your cycler or anything like that medical, make sure they do not check it. There is no guarantee it'll make it to your destination. There is no guarantee it will be taken care of. So make sure it goes on the plane with you, uh, not checked. Good point. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let's see what else we have. Uh, any other hands up? Okay, so I'm going to ask um, uh, Line, and I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. Um, we see your questions there. I feel like um, just stick behind and we'll talk one on one if you're having some difficulties getting some of these answers, and maybe we can help you um, right after. Um, just, uh, I'll pose this to everybody, um, just as we're getting close to wrapping up here, uh, we talked a lot about some of the problems that can happen, but I would love a very quick story of a really great moment while traveling that made it all worth all the luggage and things. So I'll give that to, let's start with Kathy and Irwin. So uh, I, I, yeah, I'll start. Um, when uh, just this last time, this past weekend, we were in Toronto with the grandchildren and, you know, it, it, they always sort of, they do see the machine and in the room and some of the equipment that we pile into the house. And, uh, but this time it was really sweet because in the morning I was still on the cycler and the, they're up really early before their parents and so on. And then they, the three of them snuggled into bed and started asking questions about it. Um, and then they're at the age where they, the, you know, they, they kind of understand. I mean, one of them thought that, is that your other kidney and, and different things like that. But, you know, it was just, I didn't feel ashamed about it. And it was just so nice to snuggle with them. And yes, I was on dialysis, but I had them with me and it was just a great moment. So. That's awesome. Hard to beat. Uh, Susanna, Irwin, you got something? I'll, I'll let Kathy speak for the two of us. I wasn't there for the snuggles, but uh, the smile on my wife's face right now says it all. Cute. For me, um, uh, because when I was on dialysis, I was a very strict rule follower. And so I loved taking baths. I loved swimming and everything like that. And with my catheter in my chest and then my PD um, catheter in my stomach, I chose to not go swimming and take baths. I didn't, 
want to risk anything going wrong. I know there's a lot of people that do and nothing happens, but I just, I'm nervous that way. But mine was when I got to my destinations and I could go swimming in the pools and the ocean. And now even just the simplicity of taking baths at home and stuff like that. Um, I think that is just, I think that's just amazing because I had to wait almost five years. So being able to do those simple little things and the simplicity of just saying, I'm going pee uh, is pretty amazing. (laughs) So (laughs) it's all about the simple things, right? Yeah, absolutely. And and I'll say this, um, you know, I was definitely very, very nervous uh, leading up to my trip to South Korea. It was in the second wave of COVID and numbers were getting bigger and bigger by the day and they weren't handling it at the time. And, and, you know, one, I got on this trip, which was a 13 hour flight and I was one of 10 people on the plane. So that alleviated the stress immediately right there. And then it just reminds you once you get there that even through the stress, the reasons that you do all these things, I think traveling on its own is risky inherently, you know, so it's not like we're the only ones with risk, we're just adding some risk to it. So it's really good to use all these tools that uh, everybody here has talked to uh, about just to to really push in yourself to, to do the things you love, because that's the reason we're getting the care we are. So um, yeah, I think... Um, We'll leave the Q&A there. Um, thank you so much for everybody who participated and asked all those great questions. It's, it's really helpful to, to hear from everybody. And I'll send it back to Sakshi to close us off. Yeah, um, that now brings us to the end of the session. I would like to thank our panelists, Dan, Susanna, Kathy, and Irvin. It has been a very dis- uh, helpful discussion and hopefully everyone got to learn lots from it.